Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. For more than 50 years, Wild Kingdom explored wildlife and our natural world. Tonight's episode, and many others, focus on the timeless value of wildlife conservation. Wild Kingdom played a critical role in changing public attitudes about the importance of animals for the health of our planet and our own quality of life. We challenge viewers to learn about animals and get involved in conservation in their local communities. That call to action resulted in more visits to local zoos, nature preserves, and even observing animals in their natural habitats. And that connection with animals benefits all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by the company with coverage for everyone. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Today, with the help of this little kangaroo, we're going to examine why there is such a great variety of animal life in the Wild Kingdom, and why so many animals are literally poles apart in the way they look, move, and act. <laughs> for, for instance, why is the kangaroo a ground dweller that uses its tail as a third leg and moves by hopping? Mr. Moak is a tree dweller and a real swinger. And as you can see, he has no tail at all. Not only are these animals different in the way they look and move, but you can also see they're different in the way they act. Yes, indeed. They're poles apart in all kinds of ways. But the real question is why? Well, it has a lot to do with the environment in which they live. In order to survive as a species, an animal must be adapted to its environment so that it can find its food, escape its enemies, and raise its young. If environments are different, then the animals will be different. Moak here is adapted to the humid rainforests of tropical Africa, and he will naturally be different from the little kangaroo who is adapted to the dry grasslands of Australia. But why are there different environments? Come with me, Mr. Moak, and maybe we can find out. Part of the answer lies in the shape of our Earth. Being round, the sun shines hotter on some parts than on others. Where the rays hit directly, it's hotter than where they hit on an angle where it is cooler. Since the Earth's surface is uneven, this causes differences in altitude, temperature, and rainfall. These different climatic conditions cause three major kinds of environment. The wet areas that are right around the middle of the Earth, and the drier areas that are found usually just above the middle and below the middle, and the cold areas that are found on top and on the bottom. And the animals found in these different areas are poles apart in the way they live. Let's first see how the animals live in this area, the tropical rainforest right around the middle of the earth. Rain, heat, and sunshine combine to produce an extravagant growth. Competing for a place in the sun, trees push up hundreds of feet and spread their crowns like giant umbrellas, shading everything beneath. Since there is little plant life on the ground, animals take to the trees for food. Monkeys hunt fruit and berries. The tamandua hunts the eggs of termites. And with all the decaying vegetation here, termites are plentiful. The tamandua's tail frees its claws to dig under the bark. Snakes, too, find the best hunting in the trees. The warm climate is especially favorable to them and to the other cold-blooded animals, such as this giant tree frog. 
And isn't he the high wire artist? Here is the greatest variety of animals on earth. Birds. Monkeys. Sloths. Insects. And lizards like this iguana. Mr. Mocha, I don't suppose you've ever seen an iguana lizard. Pretty, isn't he? This iguana is well adapted for life in the rainforest. He's a good tree climber because of these long toes and those sharp claws. Sometimes when animals get after him and he has to escape, he'll jump right out of a tree, 60 or 80 feet to the ground, land with a plop and keep on running. Jim has an entirely different kind of lizard over here. It is quite different. Moak may not like this one at all. Because this is a Gila monster and it's one of the two poisonous lizards in the world. Let's compare it with the iguana. The iguana is a tree dweller with long legs, whereas the Gila monster is a ground dweller and has much short, shorter legs that are quite stubby. The iguana has thin skin, whereas the Gila monster has rough, thick skin, which gives protection against the sun. And the iguana, being a lizard of the forest, requires water. The Gila monster does not require water and in this respect is characteristic of those animals that live in the dry areas of the world, the deserts. Of necessity, such animals remain on the ground. Where there is little rain, plant life is sparse and offers little in the way of food. Here again, heat favors cold-blooded animals. Yet even the rattlesnake faces a constant struggle for survival against enemies as strange and silent as the Choya cactus. For the snake, the fallen thorns of the choya can be a deadly trap. And even the tortoise, as well protected as he is, finds it hard to survive in the desert. Birds are about the only animals found above ground. Others, for the most part, stay on the surface or burrow down to where the soil is cooler and contains moisture. Where there is no moisture, there are no plants. The fringe-footed lizard is one of the very few animals that can live in such an area. It normally eats beetles and other insects, but this one appears to be just too big a mouthful. To escape the sun or an enemy, it burrows into the sand. Jim, it certainly is important for an animal to be able to escape the heat in the desert. I have a good example of that right here. This is a sand boa from India who is especially adapted for burrowing in the sand. There are places in India where the surface of the sand reaches a temperature of 120 degrees or more. By being able to burrow under the surface, the sand boa escapes this heat and he also is safer from his enemies. Hey, Mr. Moak, do you see anything down here? Like here. Oh, oh you don't need to be afraid, Moak. This is just a nice little sand boa. Well, we've seen how animals live in the wet areas and now in the dry areas, but what about those animals that are literally poles apart? Those that live in the cold areas of the world, the Arctic and the Antarctic. Here there is no vegetation. The temperature of the air may drop to 50 below zero and the winds whip the land at 90 miles an hour. Only warm-blooded animals can survive out of the water. The polar bear is doubly insulated with a heavy layer of fat and a thick fur coat. He's also equipped with snowshoes, big pads, and hair on the bottom of his feet to keep him from slipping on the ice. In the rainforest, we saw a multitude of different animals, and in the desert, quite a number. But here in the cold regions, there are very few. 
the penguin shares with the polar bear the insulating layer of fat and the thick coat, but his is a coat of feathers rather than fur. They're truly poles apart. The polar bear lives in the Arctic and the penguin in the Antarctic. They're also poles apart in their social behavior. Where the bears go it alone or in small family groups, these emperor penguins congregate in colonies of up to 50,000 individuals. To feed, they must return to the sea. And after a snowstorm, they line up like motorists on a highway, following the snowplow to their destination. I think we can easily see that an animal that lives in the desert requires a different design from the animal that lives in the polar regions or in the jungle. But when we realize that within each of these broad environments, there are many, many smaller environments requiring different designs, it is only then that we begin to see how such an enormous variety of life could develop in the wild kingdom. And that's why such an animal as this slow loris, who is more active in the nighttime and has larger eyes, must be different from an animal like this meerkat, who is more active in the daytime and has smaller eyes. Yes, and one that lives in the tree must be different from one that lives on the ground, and one that lives even at the base of the mountain must be different from the one that lives further up. And so the many different designs dictated by the many environments result in an amazing variety of contrasts in the way animals move, look, and act. For example, the ostrich has developed long, powerful legs. And even though he has wings, he's lost the ability to fly. On the other hand, the red-tailed tropic bird flies beautifully. But he's lost the ability to walk from spending so much time in the air. Some animals are supported by legs as thick as tree trunks. Others travel gracefully on legs that are long and thin. Among the thinnest legs are those of the stilt. He, of course, is one of the many two-legged animals. Many others, like the lechwe antelope, move on four. The tarantula, like all spiders, walks on eight legs. And millipedes have hundreds. Typical of most birds, the Canada goose flaps its wings to move through the air. Surprisingly enough, the stingray uses the same flapping motion to move through the water. and the porpoise propels itself by flapping its tail up and down. All these animals move in ways that are poles apart from the way that Mr. Moke moves. But there's one animal that's similar to Mr. Moke, and I think you will agree is similar in many ways to us, that rare anthropoid of tropical Africa and perhaps one of the most fascinating animals in the world, the mountain gorilla. This is gorilla country. Coming at you through his tunnel, he's a fierce looking creature, but he's principally a vegetarian and he's normally shy and unaggressive. The gorilla has come down from the trees and has become primarily a land dweller. Having taken to life on the ground, the gorilla has exchanged speed and agility for size and strength. This teenager has no trouble breaking down a stout banana tree and ripping it apart to feast on the tender and succulent heart inside.
Gorillas normally live in small family groups. A mother is devoted to her baby and keeps it with her at all times, even when she's eating. A family group usually contains two or three females and one dominant male, along with their offspring. The big male is the protector, and it's when the babies seem in danger that he performs his famous charge, all 500 pounds of them. <laughs> Perhaps the gorilla shouldn't seem so strangely similar to us because in some ways all animals are similar. For example, most animals have two eyes, two ears, and a single mouth, like Mr. Moke. And many animals have a tail, even though Moke doesn't happen to have one. But the amazing thing about an animal's tail is the different ways in which it's used. It's often used as a fly swatter or as a means of communication. A white-tailed deer warns other deer of danger by raising its tail and flashing its famous white flag. The beaver's tail sounds a warning when it slaps the water. When a bobcat is stalking prey, its tail reacts to the nervous tension. The prehensile tail possum uses his tail for climbing. The muskrat uses his to maneuver through the water in much the same way that fish do. The tail serves the kangaroo rat as a sort of a third leg. And the puma as a balance or counterweight while executing flying turns. Some animals use their tails to defend themselves. One of the very best examples is a monitor lizard. This tail is a very effective weapon. And if you don't know this, when you're handling a monitor, you're in for a real surprise. He uses his tail to whip with, and he can cause a pretty bad welt. He also uses his tail to distract your attention so he can come at you with those powerful jaws. This is one animal that has weapons on both ends. Many of the differences in animals are in the way they look or in the way they use a similar part of their body. And some of these differences are pretty striking. But there are more subtle differences too. For example, animals behave in different ways and sometimes it's difficult to interpret this behavior because actions that look the same may not mean the same thing. Many people are acquainted with fighting fish, known for the fights they have over their territories. Now it's pretty obvious that these fish are fighting, but what about this action? This may look like a fight, but these seals are actually courting. But what about these giraffes? Are they being affectionate too? No, they're fighting. Then are these goonie birds fighting? No, they're courting. The interpretation of animal behavior can be pretty confusing.
Many animals are poles apart in the way they take care of their young. A baby alligator makes his own way into the world. He comes out of the shell equipped with sharp teeth and a real fighting spirit to look out for himself. By contrast, baby possums are helpless at birth. After living the first eight weeks in mother's pouch, they spend the next few weeks riding on her back. Incidentally, this mother is a rare albino possum. A young puma setting out to explore the world may get a ride from its mother. But the trip's a little more rugged. There are also striking differences in the way animals feed. Even among water birds, there are various techniques. The pelican is a high diver. The goose is a dabbler, feeding underwater tails up. The avocet probes the bottom with its bill. While the fowler rope goes round in circles, turning up the water to bring food to the surface. No matter how different animals are in their looks, movements, and actions, each species, like this fighting fish, reflects its own environment with a beauty of form and movement in a never-ending variety of ways that's truly a marvel to behold. In order for our Earth to support such a great variety of life, it must have many, many different environments, simply because one animal's needs may be different from another's. <laughs> Every time we see a living animal, we know we're looking at a successful design, an animal that's found its place on the face of the Earth where it can compete successfully for food, be safe from its enemies, and raise its young. Even though these designs are varied and at times completely poles apart, we can't help but see the similarities, the pattern that is common to all of life. Man continually seeks to better understand this pattern of life, and as its secrets are revealed to him, we remove the mystery and increase the complete enjoyment of all of life in the wild kingdom. The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. <laughs>